this evening's speaker is Professor Brian Riersma of the Movement Science Department. And if you guys could all give him a hand, I would really appreciate it. Well, where to begin? The most logical place to begin is by saying thank you. If I were to say thank you to each individual who has had an impact on my life here at Grand Valley, we would be here until Tuesday. But I still need to thank you. My thanks is to all of you, students, faculty, support staff, community. You have had an impact on my life, and I have come to be better because of you. Thank you. It is an honor to be here in front of you tonight, and I truly thank you for coming out to listen to my last lecture. As you know, my name is Brian Remersma, and I teach in the Movement Science Department here at Grand Valley. Last lecture. This is a very interesting concept. You have but one more time in front of class. What would you say? What would I want my legacy to be? There are so many important topics and so many that are relevant to the world and relevant to my field. I could talk about sports. You guys like sports. We know that. I've spent years studying it. It seems rather logical. We could talk about obesity, which is a huge problem that, in my opinion, will be the death of us if we don't change our ways. Those of you who know me, you know and understand that I could talk about these topics for hours. But today I am here for a different reason. Today I must deliver my last lecture. So I say to you this, open your eyes. There's a world out there, and you affect it. So now I know you guys all have food in your hands and, and everything else, and I understand I just told you to open your eyes, but I want you to do me a favor. I want all of you in here to close your eyes. And just close your eyes for a moment, and, and I'll let you know when to open them back up. I think that far too often our eyes are closed. Our eyes are closed to the kid in class that is a little different from us, and they are closed to the idea that we are still much the same. They are closed to the war on the other side of the world and closed to the understanding and cultural competence that would bridge the divide. Our eyes are closed to those on the other side of the political aisle and closed to those who worship a different deity than our own. Our eyes are closed in so very many situations, sometimes I find it hard to believe that we've survived this long. But it is time. Open your eyes. And now open your hearts. Open your minds. Let in one idea, maybe two. And let's see where we can go together. Not just as individuals in an auditorium, but as people on earth. So who am I? Who is Brian Remersville? Who is this guy who's in front of you today giving you this last lecture? If I had to come up with a few words to describe myself, I would use the following. I am a teacher, I am a philosopher, and I am a futurist. As a teacher, it is my primary purpose to open the eyes of young students on campus to the world around them and offer them insight into their fields and into their lives. As a teacher, I believe in education, not indoctrination. And though I offer perspective, insight, and opinion in the classroom, I constantly tell my students to learn for themselves. I try to incorporate life lessons, new ideas, and current topics into the classroom. And it is my hope that the students respond because teaching is a two-way street. 
It requires both parties in order to work, which is something I did not appreciate when I was on the other side of the room. As a philosopher, I have studied ancient culture to better understand our own and have opened my heart and mind to the vast array of knowledge that we have at our fingertips. I have spent countless hours poring over books. I have studied Sumer, Greece, Rome, Egypt, the Mayans, and many other ancient cultures. I believe that if we look at ancient culture, we can better ourselves because we learn from them. As a philosopher, I also ask hundreds of questions of the world and often ask questions that we don't yet have answers to. As a futurist, I ponder what will happen in the world. This may be the area that's the most fun. Digging into the world's largest problems and piecing together my own version of a solution. What are the limits of technology, might be a question we'd ask. 25 years ago, this was, this was science fiction. <laughs> and here we have somebody that I wanted in attendance tonight that couldn't make it, and they're in attendance because of technology. How will the world handle continued population growth? Will we always have wars? Have we found the best system of economics yet? The questions are limitless. And the answers, that's the fun part. The answers haven't been decided yet. We, and that includes you, we get to decide our future. Now, I've not always been this way. In fact, growing up, I was quite the opposite. School was boring to me. I was the student who always had a tendency to buck the system. As a youth, I did not see the power of education, and I didn't really care for the knowledge that I was gaining. I didn't like homework, and I didn't like being told that there was only one way to do something. I always thought there might be a better solution to a given problem, and I developed a tendency to create my own path. There are hundreds of times where I simply balked at the norm, created my own direction, and dealt with the consequences as they came. Every parent-teacher conference likely included the same message. He has so much potential, or possibly he doesn't really try. Or likely, in addition, or I should say, in addition to a great number of other discouraging phrases, I'm sure. In short, school was boring. I was rebellious. I rode a skateboard and a snowboard. I had long hair. I smoked cigarettes. And generally speaking, I caused chaos. In a lot of ways, I was like John Bender with a skateboard. <laughs> Did I mention that my dad was the principal of my high school? <laughs> oh, yes. The principal. Without getting into the details of this, I'm sure you can assume what my adolescent years must have looked like. And they looked like this. <laughs> At this point, all I can tell you is it was a bumpy ride. College wasn't much different, and it wasn't until well into my 20s that I started believing in the power of knowledge. Knowledge. What is the power of knowledge? I say this. I say the more we know, the greater our capacity to learn and understand. Thus, the more we know. I see this as a powerful cycle that creates limitless potential within each of us. Potential to change lives, potential to change the world, but it's just potential. You have to turn it on. You have to decide that you want to be better tomorrow than you are today. And you must commit to the cycle. 
What happened to the cycle? Sorry about that. For it is this cycle that has gotten you here, and it, was, it is this cycle that will lead to your success. We have an advantage when it comes to knowledge. We have the potential to know more than anyone who has come before us, because we will always have more information to work with. To me, knowledge is the key that opens the doors of our future. Okay, so knowledge is the key. You know that. Where do you find it? Find it everywhere. Find it in everything you do, and you will be better because of it. The more we know, the greater our capacity to learn and understand, thus, the more we know. So, you know, I, I want you to learn, essentially. That's what I'm saying. I want you to go after knowledge. You may ask, what, what do I do? Where do I start? I'm glad you asked. Let's start with Arete. Arete is a term I learned by studying ancient Greece. Described as a virtue, Arete can be translated to mean reaching your highest potential and reaching it in all facets of life. In addition, Arete requires the individual to always be striving for this potential. So in essence, we can make the assertion that we can never truly reach our highest potential because the moment we have achieved our potential, we will have ceased the striving and we'll have then lost Arete. This idea, this consistent effort to achieve more in every facet of life would be an asset to any individual who understands its value. Let us imagine what we could accomplish together if this virtue were practiced by all we knew. Imagine what you as an individual could achieve if you were bettering yourself every moment of every day. To merely know the word is not enough. We must reflect upon it, and we must evolve and adjust as an individual. The desire to be better tomorrow than you are today comes from inside of us, inside of you. And it is up to you to strive for your highest potential. Think about this for a moment. You have learned one word so far tonight. And that one word already has the potential to change your perspective. And in fact, change your life. I want to share with you a few stories. Stories about knowledge, stories about life, stories about philosophy. Since we just spoke of Arete, I thought it fitting to discuss a story about a former student of mine. As a teacher, it is one of our goals to have a lasting impression. We hope that someone someday will come back and tell us we made a difference. We desire change, we, excuse me, we desire to change the lives of those around us. And we desire success for them in some ways because of us. Lasting impression. I did not really understand the implications of lasting impression until Brett Myers walked into my classroom one morning. We had recently discussed the Greeks in class and had learned of the virtue of Arete, a lecture I always find inspiring and truly hope that my students do too. That morning, Brett walked to the front of the room and made his way toward my desk, and he wanted me to know that my lecture was inspiring to him as well. So much so that he got it tattooed on his body. Now, let's understand something. <laughs> there was time between the lecture and the tattoo. It wasn't 10 a.m. lecture, 11.15 inking. 
Okay. It was like 12. <laughs> Let's be serious a little bit. He talked to me that day about leaving class, about studying the word erite, studying the virtue, and truly seeing the power that this one little word could hold for him. He did not mindlessly ink this word on his body, but did it with conviction and a newfound insight into life. He will indeed have a lasting impression of my class. But the story doesn't end there. Brett recently told me about his experience at indoor nationals with the pole vault. He spoke of nerves, and he spoke of his father's words. Remember what those tattoos on your sides stand for. The one being Arate, the other being a cross in remembrance of his grandfather. That day, he set a new personal record in the, in the pole vault, 16 feet, 4 inches, which was good enough for fifth in the nation. He also shared his experience at outdoor nationals, where he vaulted 16 feet, 3 inches, which was good enough for third. Lastly, he spoke of being hired as a coach in Hudsonville, where he begin, hopes to begin helping others reach their potential thus beginning his quest to change the lives of others, and in my opinion, change the world. What can we learn from this? Does this mean we should implement a Movement 101 tattooing program? <laughs> Could be fun. Could be fun. No. So, so what is the lesson here? The lasting impression was not the tattoo, but the message. The tattoo for Brett is a reminder of that message. What is your reminder of the knowledge you have learned? How will you remember to take it with you on your journey? That, my friends, is up to you. All right, so we, we have knowledge. We have the, the understanding of erite. Can we really change the world? Yes, you can. And as a matter of fact, you will. No matter what you do, what you do in life has an impact. Now let me tell you about one man who in my mind has changed hundreds of thousands of futures. Dr. Robert Harrison happens to be the gentleman on FaceTime. <laughs> Dr. Harrison was a thoracic and cardiovascular surgeon at Blodgett Memorial Medical Center for 28 years. During his career, he served in many positions, including chief of staff, chief of thoracic surgery, and associate clinical professor of surgery at the Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Known to hospice of Greater Grand Rapids as a person who inspired everyone to do the best job that they could for their patients. He was a leader. Shall we also mention the thousands of procedures he performed over the years? He changed lives daily through his position and his service. And when asked of his philosophy, the reply was simple. It never really changed much over the years. It's just doing as much for one's fellow man as is humanly possible. This is service. Let us imagine the potential impact of someone like Robert Harrison. Thousands of surgeries. Thousands of lives changed in one way or another, each individually representing a different future without our doctor. Imagine for a moment that Dr. Harrison saves one life, a man named John. John survives, marries, and has three children. Immediate world change is evident. There's additional life. 
But what happens when we look further? What happens when we look at the multi-generational impact? How might each of one of these folks change the world? Will one of them cure cancer? Might one discover cold fusion? Without Dr. Harrison, we would never know. But because of him, we may. And this is one patient. Remember, I said thousands of procedures. Thousands of surgeries, each with a created future leading down a path not yet complete. This is profound. Understand, it is not only heart surgeons that change the world. It is all of us in everything we do. We affect the world around us. Robert Harrison dedicated most of his life to the service of others. How will your life change futures? How will you impact the world around you? You will change lives, all of you. And you will have your lives changed by interacting with the world around you. You now know this means you will need to strive. But it also means you may need to change. Be willing to change. My story about willingness to change begins and ends with my father. If you remember, he was a principal. I was the rebellious child. Teenage years looked like this. Years of fighting the system and fighting the parents had, all, had finally come to a head. And I made some pretty big mistakes. To put it bluntly, I screwed up with a capital S, as big as that capital S could be. And I pushed my parents to the breaking point. I never listened. I never understood my impact on others and really had no idea how much trouble I was causing. But I remember that day. Walking into the house, hugging my mom, tears in her eyes, and hearing her say, your dad is in the bedroom. He wants to talk to you. We've all been here. <laughs> this is usually the point in a child's life where they know they are about to be read the riot act and endure great vocal anguish. But this time was different. I walked into the bedroom and there was my dad facing the dresser not even turning in my direction to say the following. This is it, he said. This is the last thing I can do for you. And as he turned around with tears in his eyes, the entire world simply disappeared around me. Be willing to change. It was time to change. It was time to glue my head on straight and begin a better life. Now, I will not stand up here and say that I never again made a mistake or failed. But I can tell you this. I have tried to ensure that if I ever see my parents crying again, it's tears of joy and not tears of sadness. Many moments have changed my life. But this moment, in ways, changed our family. And we are all better because of it. Now, to me, this is a story about family. This is a story about trials and tribulations and coming out on the other side together. For you, this is a story about willingness to change. Because had I not been willing to change, I wouldn't be here in front of you today. For I would have never had my first lecture, let alone my last. Will you be willing to adapt and adjust as life happens around you? Will you learn from your mistakes and become better because of them? 
My willingness to change set forth a new path for myself, a path toward enlight enlightenment that for the moment culminates in this auditorium, a culmination that I believe shows my impact here at Grand Valley. I taught here for over a year before I began to see my impact. During my second year, which happened to be my first year full time, I walked into Movement Science Pride Night and I bumped into Tim Lair. <laughs> Tim was a student of mine in a previous semester. Now, Tim has never known this before, but one sentence that night changed lives. I really enjoyed your class. Very inspiring. That's it. One sentence. But I knew with that one sentence that my message was getting out. People had to be noticing. I also mention Tim Layer because Tim is a student I believe illustrates my next lesson. Get involved in life. Tim Layer is involved in life. In talking with Tim, you can immediately see the impact that GVSU has had on his life. You can also see that he is excited to return the favor. Whether it is me overhearing the praise of campus life while he gives a campus tour, or seeing the success of the Swim and Dive Club for which he is president, Tim's presence is truly felt across campus. He is president of the Delta Upsilon Fraternity, a student senator, and he even has a Sunday radio show on the whale. When I think about what Tim will take away from this school, I think about his experiences. He has done so much in a short amount of time on campus, and it is thrilling to see him thrive. When he asked me to help with the Swim and Dive Club as faculty advisor, I graciously accepted, but I was very clear. This will be on you, I said. I will advise, but it's your club. Little did I know that a year later, the club would have over 40 members, would have been voted best new club, and would have the foundation built to thrive when Tim moves on. Tim, you may once have said that I inspired you. Today I say it is you who inspires me. Tim is involved in life. Are you? Are you taking advantage of all that this wonderful university has to offer? Are you progressing and growing as an individual? If the answer is no, the next question is simple. What will you do to get involved in life? This is a question you must answer for yourself. Getting involved in life is done with the little things we do every day. And it is not a passive process. It requires commitment. Commitment is a word that I have mentioned a few times tonight. Commit to the cycle of learning. Commit to reaching your highest potential. Commit to the community and commit to getting involved in life. In these areas, I'm telling you to commit to the process. Be like my father. Commit to a town, to a school, to a family. Be like my brother, commit to a master's program that will better support you and your family. A program that will make you a better teacher and a better person. Be like Tim Lair and commit to your school and your future. Be like Brett Myers and commit to reaching your highest potential. Be like Robert Harrison and commit to making the world a better place because you were here. 
By being committed, we open up the opportunity to be more successful in everything that we do because we work harder for it and we get much more out of it. Where have you committed in your life? And more importantly, where have you not committed that you should? These questions will undoubtedly drive you forward. Let us talk for another moment about Robert Harrison. We know he changed lives. We know he made a difference in the world. He was committed to his profession. He was committed to his family and his community. His commitment to others left little time for himself. And his health suffered. He had a massive coronary and complications in surgery which resulted in drastic life changes. Walking became more difficult. Gardening, which was a passion, became something he could not do alone. Life was now a challenge as every aspect of his had changed in a day's time. Now as with every, up, every situation in life, new challenges bring forth new opportunities. How we approach these challenges and how we overcome them will impact our lives. Now, I tell you to face challenges and over, overcome obstacles. I have known Robert Harrison since I moved to Grand Rapids. I was his personal trainer when we met, something that I still do for him today. And the day I met Bob is a day I'll never forget. He slowly shuffled across the room toward my office and I began to recall his former trainer's words to me. Take it easy on him, she said. He shuffles when he walks. He can't lift his right arm. We focus on basic mobility, flexibility, and he walks on the treadmill. We spent our first few weeks doing just that, really just getting to know each other and building trust in one another. But then I started to ask questions. I started to pose challenges. What if we put a stronger emphasis on strength training? Would it improve his walking? We started to experiment with techniques and methods, and we had to go beyond the norm more than once. He couldn't lift his right arm, which posed great problems. His upper body was continuing to weaken over the years, and this was something that was not going to improve spontaneously. So I asked more questions, and we tried more new techniques, and with each passing day, we learned more. He couldn't lift his right arm, but if I lifted it, he could pull it down. He couldn't lift his arm, but if we positioned a weight against it, he could press that weight out. We faced our challenges and overcame obstacles. As the time passed, we broke more barriers. Over the years, he has continued to progress because of his commitment to exercise and his commitment to life. I would like to share qu three qu quick anecdotes about our relationship. Not all related to commitment or challenge, but just life, just related to life. The first relates to the idea that Bob could not lift his right arm above his head. Months after we began our training, Bob went on vacation. And at this time, I really didn't know if I had done anything to change his life. But his arrival home suggested just that. This time, as he walked toward my office with a spring in his step and a smile on his face, I could tell something was different. How was your vacation, I asked. Great, he said excitedly. You wouldn't believe what, just happen or what happened on the plane. He went on to tell me about lifting a bag into the overhead compartment by himself, something I know he could not have done six months earlier. And I knew it was special. 
Now this could easily be a story about progress, determination, perseverance, but it's not. This is a story about the little things in life and appreciating them. Far too often we forget to appreciate the little things. And we sweat the small stuff. You guys have all heard that, right? Don't sweat the small stuff. I say this, don't sweat the small stuff and appreciate the little things. This next quick story relates to a day when I uh, arrived at Bob's house and knocked on the door. Usually that knock is followed by, come in, Brian, but, and it comes from the den. That sound does. But this day was different. On this day, I could tell he wasn't in the den. He was in the dining room. Now, this would not have been a big deal, except when I opened the door, he wasn't as I expected. He was lying on the floor. He had a pillow under his head. He was comfortable. But you see, he fell down. And though we had spent years to this point working on strength, he could still not get up on his own. Another challenge we must overcome, I thought to myself. And I began implementing a plan that would ensure that he would never have to wait on the floor for someone else to pick him up again. I taught him a sequence of movements that put him in position to get himself up, the, up off the ground. Now since that day, he has only fallen one time, but he was able to get back up. To me, this is a story about falling down and getting up. In life, there are times when we must get up on our own, and at no time is that more important than when we fall. You will fall down. You will fail. You will make mistakes. But will you pick yourself back up when it happens? The last quick story about Bob was on a day when we were talking about his life and about the future. We were talking about what the future of the world holds and where the, what the future might look like 50 years from now. And we were kind of looking back at the last 20 or last 100 years and talking about how much had changed over time. It was a conversation about life. And little did I know that his words would change mine. In speaking of the future, he went on to say, I won't be here to see it. And this made me sad. Sad because Bob is more than just a client. He is a friend. He is family. The sadness soon left, though, when he looked at me and said, you know, Brian, I may not be here to see the world in 50 years, but if it weren't for you, I wouldn't be here today. His message was loud and clear. I had changed his life. There are many other stories I'd love to share with you about Bob. But in the interest of time, I will simply tell you this. For years, I have worked tirelessly to give him a better life. And though he would never know it, while I was changing his life, he was changing mine. I learned to be more creative. I learned to be more patient. I learned to be more caring. I learned about limits and barriers and crashing through them with our own internal desires. I learned about commitment to self and others. And I learned about being better in my life because others counted on it. Now, I sincerely hope that these few stories have taught you something. And if it were up to me, we would stay here all night and I would just tell stories. And you guys know, I got hundreds more. <laughs> but your time is valuable, and I want to respect that. I do have a few other thoughts before we close this out. Some simple advice to take with you when you leave. 
Number one, seize opportunity. Throughout your life, you will be presented with opportunity countless times. Whether or not you seize it when it comes available to you is your decision, but you must. Here at Grand Valley, I can think of countless times where opportunity presented itself to me and I could have let it pass by. I was hired as an adjunct, one class, one semester. That's it, nothing more. I said yes. Then a couple weeks later, a call came asking me if I could teach one other class. Of course, I said yes. And shortly before the semester began, Brian Hatzel called me one more time and asked, could I teach one more? To which I said, yes. A year later, I was interviewing for a position at GRCC. It was a full-time position. It paid much more. Brian Hatzel asked me if I would stay here. And I said yes. As the next year passed, many other opportunities came across my desk. We needed to submit a new course proposal. And the author had just left for another school. I saw opportunity. I seized it. The following winter, our department was in a pinch and had nobody to teach a volleyball class. It was going to potentially get canceled. I saw opportunity. I seized it. When told of the nomination for last lecture this year, I could have balked at the amount of work it, at the amount of work it would require to give this lecture. But I only saw opportunity. So I went after it with everything that I had. Now understand this. None of these opportunities are here. If I say no to Brian Hatzel about that one class, that one semester, I took the first opportunity and it led to many more. Number two, seek experience, not title. You all have dreams. You all have aspirations of what you want to do when you leave school. And more often than not, we are concerned with what job we have rather than what we are doing. I was this way. I wanted to be the leader. I wanted to be in charge. I wanted to run the show. I thought that leadership came with title, but it doesn't. Leadership is a state of mind. Leadership is something we do, not something given to us because of our position. We can lead from everywhere we are, every day we live. And the person at the bottom of the organizational chart can show as much leadership as those at the top. Don't worry about the job you get right out of school. It isn't the job you will have for the rest of your life. It's just the first opportunity. You will leave here with theory and a degree, but your experiences will define your success. Embrace the experience. Earn the right to move forward, and you will be respected by those around you. Number three, you are a role model. You will change lives. I had a lot of conversations leading up to this lecture. But one part of one conversation stuck with me. I had asked the following question to a coach. Can you describe an instance to me where you changed a life? The response, I didn't really like this question because I don't really view my job that way. That's fine, I thought. 
<clears throat> but as the conversation went on, I began to think more about this response. The coach mentioned being a role model to the players and mentioned having former players invite them to wedding, weddings or other functions later in life. Players always coming in for advice, not only about school, but about life. These students came here as teens and left as adults. Now look, I might be a bit of a philosopher, but does that not suggest that you change lives? You will be a role model whether you know it or not. Embrace the opportunity to change lives for the better. Two more ideas. Two more quick thoughts that I want to leave you with tonight. And with these two ideas, I want to be very clear about something. This is the philosopher and the futurist in me. And I am saying that we need to progress for our future. The two ideas that I want to leave you with are teamwork and cultural competence. Teamwork is something we talk about every day in life and career. And we know, we know that if we cannot work well with others, we will struggle in both life and career. We learn teamwork from infancy, and throughout our lives, we see its value. Can you then explain how, as a country, we are on opposing sides, fighting a civil war at the ballot box, and growing further apart as a nation? Do we not see that we are all connected and all affected by one another? And this applies to more than just our country. This applies to the world. This means we must become culturally competent, all of us. When we truly come to know and understand different cultures, we realize that we are very much the same. I will admit, this is an area where I'm reaching beyond the student body. I am telling you that as a world, we will fail without these ideas. To me, the futurist, I see three paths, and I see only three. Total annihilation. Constant conflict, or global unity. We must learn to work together as individuals at this school, as citizens of Michigan, and as citizens of the United States. But we must also work together as humans in the world. Just for a second, just imagine, imagine what we could accomplish if we truly work together. All right, so just another minute, minute or two here. You guys know I could go on forever, you know that. And it is impossible to teach you everything that I know in one hour. But remember, the more we know, the greater our capacity to learn and understand, thus, the more we know. So, how do we wrap all of this up? What have we heard? What have we learned tonight? What can the world learn from this lecture? A lot, I hope. What do I want in your mind as you walk out the door tonight? That's simple. I want this. We have learned the power of knowledge 
and the importance of Erete. We have heard examples from life, and we now know our impact. We will go forward, willing to change, involved in life, and seizing opportunity. Seeking experience over title, we will embrace challenge as the world's way of telling us that we live. We will be role models to our fellow man, and we will strive to reach our highest potential. We will choose not to sweat the small stuff, and we will embrace the little things. We will go forward as responsible citizens, thinking about more than just ourselves. We will work together as citizens, and we will be committed to the cause. It's time, my friends, it's time to open your eyes. It's time to change the world. Thank you. <laughs>